But let's turn to, I think, the one paper, and again, this is Marina Stolakis's group, uh, small numbers, but I think this was the first to really show that regular weight training really is a benefit. So this was five patients with sporadic IBM. They did three times a week of resistance training, three sets of starting at 10, and then they would do 15 and 20 reps. So the first one was 10, 15, 20. I think it's reasonable just for people to remember 12 to 15 reps. And so by a set, so for example, I do arm curls, leg extensions, and maybe some crunches, go through that set again so that you're going back to the same exercise about two to three minutes later. So your muscles resting as you go through that. And then you go on to you know, three other exercises uh, to do three sets. And what they did is you can use weights. In this case, they used what's called a pneumatic resistance. So when you pull, air squeezes out of a tube. When you push, the air squeezes out. These devices are not as common as they were back uh, when they did this study, uh, but with standard weight machines that you can either purchase at home or use in a gym, uh, you're gonna get the same benefits. So what did they uh, find? Uh, this is the baseline for a variety of measurements that they did uh, in post-training. And what you can see is that the percent increase was pretty impressive. So, I mean, even for leg curls, 120% uh, uh, increase, very dramatic. And I think this one here, the leg press, and really leg press is what you do in your daily activities. When you go up a flight of stairs, get out of a chair, you're pushing your legs. And that's very quadricep dependent, which is the weakest muscle in IBM uh, in the lower extremities. And you can see that there's pretty impressive improvements, which will translate to better functional capacity. And again, uh, this is just looking at um, the improvements uh, generally across uh, the board in the upper and lower extremities. Now, what they didn't do is they didn't do finger-specific uh, training. Um, any of you who are interested, we do have an IBM-specific weight um, and resistance exercise program for home, uh, which includes a special gripper for your fingers so that you can try and uh, work on that finger strength. And uh, we'd be happy to make that publicly available to anyone. And we're working on our YouTube channel uh, to show how to exercise in a variety of disorders, with IBM being one of our main ones. So which mode is better? Should you do in, you know, more of a weight training resistance program? Should you do endurance? I think ideally both. Um, and what you can do is say, you know, this morning I was watching somebody in the gym and they warmed up for 15 minutes on elliptical and then she went and did a circuit weight training. You know, I think that's one approach that would work very well for patients. Um, you know, start off with you know, spinning on a bike, walking on a treadmill going outside for a brisk walk, um, cycling, rowing, whatever it is, uh, endurance, and then do a circuit set. Um, if you like free weights, that's fine. Uh, be careful with them, make sure you know what you're doing or use uh, you know, a standard gym with the uh, weight machines that you've seen. Again, get proper um, um, advice, how to use them. Uh, there's a variety of kinesiologists that are personal trainers and such who can show you how to use these things. We are working on our YouTube channel to show you that as well. Now, the other approach would be Monday, you do your endurance, Tuesday, you do resistance, back to endurance, resistance, and you can alter it that way, or uh, do a hard Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and take a day off in between. Whatever uh, works for your schedule is uh, what's best for you. And again, you know, we think the benefits for resistance exercise is your muscle strength, but also bone health because people are more likely to trip and fall. And we've certainly seen a lot of fractures in IBM over the years. So you wanna make sure that your bone health is good. Another reason to identify and treat vitamin D deficiency. And for endurance, uh, as we get older, there's a higher cardiovascular risk, uh, diabetes risk, and there's even lower cancer risk in those who are regularly exercising. So what about some nutritional therapies for IBM? One of the things that was pretty clear, we did a study years ago in a variety of our patients with muscular dystrophy, uh, Duchenne mitochondrial disease, and IBM patients. And uh, across all of uh, those folks, we uh, found that people were not meeting the Canadian recommended intake for almost every uh, nutrient. Uh, a particular concern, of course, uh, is protein, which we'll talk about, uh, but also things like vitamin D, which I mentioned, vitamin B12 and folate. Uh, deficiencies of which can all lead to uh, neurolocomotor uh, disability. So we uh, generally say when you, uh, you know, meet a patient for the first time, make sure you check and replace vitamin D, B12, and folate in particular. Uh, we recommend adequate protein intake. 
many people are not moving very much, so they don't eat very much, and they often are not eating high quality foods. So proteins such as milk-based protein, egg-based protein, meats and fish uh, are all good quality uh, protein. Of course, lean cuts, not too much fat, um, you know, when you're, you're eating uh, animal-based protein, uh, but the aim is to get uh, about 50 to 60% higher than the Canadian recommended intake, which amounts to about 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kilogram per day. In general, we recommend a multivitamin, and that's because almost every vitamin that, uh, is in the Canadian food um, recommendation, what's called the dietary reference intake, was deficient in our patients. That's just a good insurance policy. I'll talk about creatine in for IBM, and uh, we're now looking also in FSH dystrophy and myotonic. Uh, we think that uh, helping the mitochondria could be a benefit, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the first thing that we looked at years ago, and this was a study that we did uh, back in 1999, uh, we found uh, very low levels of total creatine uh, in uh, muscle. And it was particularly um, prevalent in inflammatory myopathies, including IBM, PM, and DM. And why this is important is that creatine is very important for uh, maintenance of muscle mass. Um, and uh, creatine is uh, consumed every day in the diet if you eat meat uh, or fish. Uh, if you don't, you're a vegan vegetarian. It is all uh, dependent then on production from the liver, pan and pancreas, and kidneys. Creatine itself, uh, we generally have about one to two grams per day that comes into our body. It's mostly in skeletal muscle, um, and it's used to help maintain uh, muscle energy status, and it also helps to maintain uh, muscle mass by inhibiting protein breakdown. Creatine is converted to creatinine, which you might be familiar with, which is a um, convenient marker of uh, renal function, uh, which is then excreted in the kidneys. So many of you will probably have low creatinine if your kidneys are functioning well because of the low muscle mass with IBM. And um, because of the high CK, you're pouring out the enzyme, which helps you to use creatine. So this is why, one, we saw these deficiencies and given its important function, we thought it was reasonable to replace this in our patients. So uh, we did this uh, study, this was in patients with mitochondrial disease many years ago, and we also published um, at the, the same time another study uh, in 13 patients uh, with IBM. Uh, essentially what we did is we gave them creatine supplementation. Um, it works out to around 100 milligrams per kilogram or one gram per kilo uh, is what we generally recommend now. Um, we had slightly higher in this um, study. Bottom line is, is that when they took creatine versus the placebo, and these are people coming in on one or on the placebo, and neither us nor the patients knew what they were on, uh, there was an increase in strength. And we saw very similar increases of around 12% uh, in our patients with IBM as well. So the benefits in muscular dystrophy, um, and this has been shown first in the exercise physiology and aging literature, uh, great evidence for increase in uh, fat-free mass or muscle mass, strength and power, uh, some evidence that it works as an antioxidant. We know there's mitochondrial dysfunction with aging and in IBM, and that might be some benefit. Uh, and also there's an increase in calcium that comes into the muscle, which can uh, activate protein breakdown. So there's uh, benefits uh, by preventing that calcium influx. So people have published a number of studies. Again, this study here, randomized double-blind trial by a group in Germany, showing that when they loaded folks with creatine, they got an increase in muscle strength and their neuromuscular symptomatology was better. Uh, this included patients uh, with Becker muscular dystrophy and FSH, uh, but at the um, biochemical level, uh, we're finding many of the final common pathways are pretty much the same between IBM, um, FSH, and um, myotonic dystrophy, which really is just almost a form first of accelerated aging at the cellular level. Uh, we went on to do a randomized double-blind trial in boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Again, uh, around one gram per kilo per day. Uh, it was randomized double-blind, so we didn't know and they didn't know what they were on. Uh, but what we did show in this study here uh, was there was less drop in their muscle function over time, increase in their grip strength, increase in muscle mass, and interestingly, um, less bone breakdown. Um, and that's important because a lot of these kids are treated with prednisone, but also for older adults, it's important because of increased bone fragility and osteoporosis. 
So at first uh, we saw this in a study from Belgium, we didn't believe it. So that's why we measured entilopeptides and indeed they were down. So we went on to do studies in rats and mice with steroids and we even did bone culture work, et cetera, clearly showing there's benefits to bone with creatine. So then when people have looked at uh, the entire world literature where they did what's called a meta-analysis where every study published in the world on creatine was put together, um, the overall uh, conclusion was there's about an 8.5% increase in strength and a 0.63 kilo increase in muscle mass. And you might think that's not a lot, uh, but we treat our boys with Duchenne dystrophy with prednisone, which gives them a 6% increase in strength and pretty much every toxic side effect known to mankind. And interestingly, if you're already on prednisone, certainly our Duchenne data shows that the creatine's additive and helps to protect against some of the side effects. So are there other, you know, and this is now starting to get into more of our research and what we're hoping to do over the next couple of years. Um, it's pretty clear that there's uh, more than expected for the age uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. So my point is, as we get older, we all get mitochondrial dysfunction, um, but with IBM for every specific age, there's about double the mitochondrial dysfunction that you would expect to see. So there seems to be something about the IBM process, which is further damaging mitochondria. And just like our patients with primary mitochondrial disease, would it benefit to add um, optimal protein, optimal um, uh, creatine, and a mitochondrial enhancer? And we're uh, hoping to be able to study this over the next couple of years to add the mitochondrial cocktail to our IBM patients with the optimal cocktail of creatine, protein, and mitochondrial enhancers. So we know as we age, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we age. And to a large extent, um, the atrophy that we see with IBM, when you actually look at the cellular level, uh, we see a lot of similarities to just accelerated human aging. And I won't go through all of this, um, but um, at the fundamental cellular level, if you look at the muscle and you use various measurements, you can see that there's inflammation and there's mitochondrial dysfunction. So those are targetable things with nutraceutical or nutritional approaches. And when the mitochondria don't work, they activate all sorts of uh, pathways. There's a whole cascade of pathways which further damage muscle. Um, you know, there's increased inflammation, there's increased oxygen stress. Uh, so oxygen stress is a process where we damage our uh, protein, our DNA, and our lipids. And that's where antioxidants come in to mitigate some of that. Um, if this process, uh, you know, it feeds on itself, further damages the mitochondria and causes more muscle atrophy and muscle dysfunction. So it becomes a positive feedback cycle. So when there's damage to mitochondrial DNA from these free radicals, it causes more damage. But at the functional level, when we become uh, weak because of the atrophy, you tend not to move as much. If you don't move, you get more muscle atrophy, which just perpetuates this functional um, uh, vicious cycle. And so that's the reason why we want to get people more active so that they can reverse some of this uh, pathway. And even if the muscle does not increase in bulk, although there is evidence that that does happen, if we can increase strength, that's really at the end of the day what people want because the stronger you are, the more functional you are and the less likely you are to require assistive devices or be disabled. So we've looked at various nutraceuticals. And again, you can't just throw everything into the mix because uh, people have shown with certain nutraceuticals, it can attenuate the benefits of exercise. We found in one study with, that we did in young people um, for a different reason, but we put a whole bunch of antioxidants together and it actually made it worse. People be, had a pro-oxidant effect, but we logically targeted in our mitochondrial patients with severe mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative stress and muscle weakness, specifically uh, stuff that we thought was gonna work and I'll show you that it did. So we did a clinical trial where people were on um, our supplement, they were washed out for a period and then on placebo or vice versa. And what we gave them was coenzyme Q10, alpha lipoic acid, vitamin E and creatine monohydrate in patients with genetically confirmed mitochondrial disease. And what we found uh, was it was being absorbed, the um, CoQ10 went up in the plasma, uh, markers of what's called oxidative stress, uh, those free radicals were lower, and lactate uh, going down means the mitochondria are working better. So that went down and another marker of oxidative stress went down on our uh, cocktail. So that is what we call our mitochondrial core cocktail. 
And um, we um, have many of our IBM patients uh, you know, taking that. Uh, these can all be purchased from uh, Costco, from local um, uh, pharmacies. Um, but we want to study this um, more aggressively. Unfortunately, we haven't been funded for this, uh, but we may have some uh, slush money to, uh, to do that this year. Uh, we are doing this in FSH and um, myotonic dystrophy, where we're going to tweak it a little bit differently. Essentially, the cocktail that would work best for IBM is really what we're um, using for older adults. So based on that, we've done many studies. And again, in full disclosure, this is our company called Stay Above Nutrition. Uh, but I've done 35 years of research uh, trying to optimize muscle strength in patients. But we've used aging as our model because it's a lot easier to, in a homogeneous group, uh, and to get people very quickly through studies to study in older adults and then apply back to patients. And that's pretty much what we've done. We have three randomized double blind trials of what we call Muscle 5, where what we did is we looked at everything that uh, we knew from our work and others uh, should improve muscle function in older adults who were skinny, weak, and have mitochondrial dysfunction. So what we have in here is whey and casein. Uh, the whey stimulates protein synthesis. The casein attenuates degradation. Um, we have creatine here at three grams total dose. Um, for IBM and our myopathy patients, we usually add an extra two grams to that. Um, uh, but in this, it uh, contains three grams. Um, we've got vitamin D, of course, for the reasons we've described, calcium to help with bones, and calcium also has some beneficial effects on muscle. Now, um, we've done this independently, and we've done it with omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 has been shown to have anti-catabolic effects. And in one of our studies in older adults, we actually showed that this increased cognition in older adults. So this was the first study. Uh, my um, friend and colleague, Stu Phillips, uh, was the lead author on this. And um, our company actually bought the patent. And what we did is we tweaked it to make it more palatable, um, to uh, bring down um, the uh, creatine a little bit um, and a few other things to make it uh, compatible with um, Health Canada guidelines. And we have an NPN level three license in Canada to supply this. And again, we have three clinical trials, two in older adults, and we've also got one in uh, younger adults showing the benefits. Um, so to summarize, there's a lot of similarities across the diseases we see um, you know, in aging. We see weakness. We see um, it decreased VO2 max, in, uh, problems with uh, uh, functional capacity. Uh, there's mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, and inflammation. Exercise can reverse most of these. It's been shown to reverse most of them um, in patients with mitochondrial disease. FSH dystrophy, very little research. We've started in, to expand the research in myotonic dystrophy, and there's a paper in uh, Journal of Clinical Investigation just coming out. Uh, well, actually, it just came out, I should say, and it's uh, publicly available to everyone, where we showed improvements in mitochondrial function, decreased inflammation with exercise in patients with myotonic dystrophy. As I've shown you, there is evidence uh, of improvements in strength and um, endurance in patients with IBM. We don't know about some of these molecular pathways, and that's what we're hoping to uncover in the next little while. Um, and in one study, it looked like there was a slight decrease in inflammation. So that's why I would say likely here. So with that, I'll finish. Um, these are the folks in the lab that have done much of this work, uh, our clinic, local collaborators, and highlight our um, uh, national collaborators and all of the funding. Thanks very much.